All right, on the video number one, I talked about basically what is the fuel, what is gasoline. Uh, now that we've got the gasoline, we have to take it, stick it into our carbs. We got to run it down in, run it through the engine, and then we got to push it out the exhaust. So uh, I would say for today, I'm going to talk about carburation, uh, intake into the combustion chamber, and then out the exhaust port. And uh, I think that'll be good enough for this one. Next on the list is going to be, uh, I would suppose, the carburation or fuel injection of the fuel. So from the factory, they came with a carburetor like this. I think this is a PIC-34 of some sort. But this kind of carburetor sits on top of a manifold. That you can see that this happens to be a dual port because it's got the boots. It's attached to a bunch of steel down here. Steel doesn't transfer heat particularly well. Uh, we've got some heat runners down in here that do or don't transfer heat particularly well. And uh, in general, because this particular system doesn't do a good job either at the transition, the down has to make right angle turns, which are bad. They cause turbulence. They cause the fuel to twirl and swirl and re-clump. So the carburetor itself does a decent job of atomizing the fuel, but then it gets into this crummy manifold where bad things start to happen. Uh, you then pull it into the combustion chamber, and you've got places where there's clunky fuel and places where there's no fuel, so you end up getting rich areas and lean areas. And as a result of this, this particular type of carburetor induction system ends up knocking. So if this system's going to knock, you have to lower your compression in order to compensate for its failure to be able to you know, work with the fuel properly. Lower compression, lower efficiency motor more temperature for the exact same amount of power. So one, they don't produce very much power because they're a crappy intake system, but they also do a bad job of vaporizing the fuel. So you got to step up a little tiny bit. So you might step up to, let's say, a dual uh, system like this. This is a progressive power of carb of some sort. I think it's a Weber. You can tell by the bar right there, but it's got the same problem. It's got the right angle bends that happen down in here. It's got an aluminum manifold, which is nice. So if you can get any heat up into this, it at least has a shot at warming up the manifold. Same basic inherent problem. So it's got this long, stupid runners, and you have to have the intake manifold heat. Next up might be this guy right here. Again, we've got a nice aluminum manifold down in here. We've lost, if you look down in here, we've lost the right angle bends, which is good. But it's still, it's reliant on... Uh, manifold heat. You've got to be able to get manifold heat up into here, and if you don't, this kind of a system is going to have problems vaporizing the fuel properly. Next step up. This is where you need to go in order to really drop your temperatures. You've got to have a system where you split the carburetor and stick the fuel vaporization atomization portion closer to your intake valve. This happens to be a set of dual cadrons. I'm not particularly a cadron fan, but it has the basics of what it needs to be. It's a short runner with a vaporization happening right above the intakes. And there's all kinds of systems that work like this. And uh, there's not really that big a difference, I think, as far as engine heat goes to running dual dual bowers, such as uh, like, like dual sets of DRLA, DRLA 40s or something like that. It's not really going to improve it that much. And then the jump up after the carburetors is to go to fuel injection, but uh, you don't want a center mount fuel injector. It's going to have the same problem. You ever looked at the Mexican fuel injection system? I wouldn't touch that. But uh, a multi-point system where you're injecting just above the valves, that's really what you're looking for. You want to cool your motor off, you run with the best carburation systems you can get, or a multi-point fuel injection system. Let's move on to compression ratio. So over here at the SAMO, some guy coming here, he's got a camshaft, he's got a cheater cam, right over in here, cheater cam. And he's asking the Cognizanti over here, what do I do with this thing? What do I set my compression ratio at? And uh, the thing about compression ratio is that the higher your compression, the more efficient the motor is going to be. Uh, Berg's philosophy of low compression produces better power and is more efficient and has cooler temperatures. Berg also sold semi-hemi machine work for the, the combustion chambers. So semi Hemi opens the combustion chamber up, increases the volume. So it makes sense that if you're going to sell a Hemi, semi Hemi um, machine service, that you'd want to compare that with what happens. So Berg was biased and he was in fact wrong. And what's nice about this particular thread is there's not a single person in this thread that's telling this guy, 
you're going to run cooler and develop more power if you run six to one with that camshaft. They're all telling him, basically, you run as much compression with that cam as you possibly can. They are recommending that he not really go up into the nine to one range, which is good. But they are on board with the fact that yes, higher compression is better. It's more efficient. What's really nice is, let's read what one of these guys in here says. Running 7 to 1 compression will actually raise the engine temperatures. And this is right, because it's less efficient to make the same power. You have to put more fuel and air in, which releases more heat, which means you get more waste heat, higher exhaust temperatures, all of which is bad for temperatures. But he tested it. I tested this out in the 1904. Started out 7 to 1, drove it for 1,000, pulled it, raised it to 8 7. Drives cooler, more power, better MPGs. More compression. As much as you can get in there before knock. Of course, you have to understand what you're doing. So you don't just build 9 to 1. And maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Uh, one of the things these guys did not really mention, you do have to take into account where you're going to be driving. Um, like I say, if you're in the mountains and you've got low air pressures in the mountains, then you can run higher compression ratios. But anyway, I have an entire video on compression ratio. Don't want to get into the details with this. That's it for compression. Just run as much as you think you can get away with, and you will run cooler. All right, in honor of this wickedly hot 108 degree day, what are we at now? Ooh, we've dropped to 106. It's about, you know, about 5 in the afternoon now. So let's go into the garage real quick and take a look at the head. Head porting. Uh, basically, see this one over here? Don't really give a crap. As far as cooling your motor goes, intake is not going to bother you that much. Let's take a look at the spark plug right here. Okay, you see these little edges right there? It goes without saying, you might want to round those down a little tiny bit. I did not do it on this one right here. It's not going to make a huge difference. The spark plug. Notice that the spark plug sticks up into the combustion chamber. You might want to take your spark plug and round that edge off a little tiny bit. I have not with this, but again, it's, some of it comes down to, are you knocking or not knocking? If you're not knocking, these things aren't going to really help you that much. Uh, now let's go to the port over here. Okay, generally speaking, you push open the valve, and stuff wants to go down that hole through this curtain area right here. And it's going that way. And notice that I can't see anything back in this area over here. Well, if I can't see it, do I really need to port anything on that side? Not really. And on this particular head, uh, there's a little tiny bit of a machine line right down in that area right there. That's not too bad. I never touched it. Don't really need it. You can make yourself nuts going crazy with this little crack right here. Well, we've got to make this really smooth and whatnot. No, you don't. Like I said, it wants to go that direction, and what's back in here is pretty much invisible to the, that direction. So it's behind the valve. I've got my valve reversed in here so you can see the impact of what's happening with the valve stuck in there. Uh, the biggest piece you want to do is this particular curtain area right here. Uh, the stock stuff is going to have a lot of metal, and this hole is going to be really tiny. So you just kind of blend it back. You blend it back a little tiny bit like this and open it up and then smooth it out. I'm not sure I did it with this one, but just a little piece of sandpaper passed through the system. And just kind of take the sandpaper and a little back and forth like that and just kind of smooth it out a little tiny, a little tiny, tiny bit. Now as far as this end of it goes, don't ever touch this side right here. This is, uh, remember now, you're not trying to make power. You're trying to be cool. So you keep the port as small as possible. You're like, oh, oh but it's not going to flow any. Yeah, it's going to flow plenty. Uh, the exhaust gases are under tremendous pressure. And when you pop open your exhaust valve, the exhaust gases are going to exit the system. There's nothing you can do that will stop it. Uh, the problem is, if you consider that it's a fluid, it is a, you know, it's a mechanical system, and this entire thing is like a pump. So, you know, it puts energy in and out, but then when you burn the fuel, you've really put some energy into the system. So what's sitting in your combustion chamber in here is under pressure. You pop open the valve, and the pressure gets turned to velocity. So the velocity goes down and out. If the velocity has gone up, ask yourself what happened to the pressure as it's going down through this system. So 
a high velocity means a low pressure. And if you remember the, you know, the ideal gas law, if your pressure goes down, this is a compressible fluid. If your pressure goes down, your temperature goes down. So keep the velocity as high as possible and you reduce temperature, which is fantastic. Higher, pro sorry, lower pressure also means lower density. Fewer molecules per surface area unit transferring heat. So your temperature goes down. Uh, number of molecules per unit of area is going to go down. They get out of the system faster. Less time for them to interact with the walls. And when you hog it out, you've also increased the surface area of the opening. Can we see that going around? Yeah, if you hog this out, you've increased the surface area, which again increases the heat transfer rate. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about the exhaust. Okay, you've got a pipe that comes out over here like this. So what's hotter? The head, which is being actively cooled with all these fins and there's air blowing across it. Or this pipe that's stuck over here. Now, there are people who think that, well, you put the stock heater box on, it's got some air pushing over uh, from the factory system. No, 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 it's not how it works. This, over here, this pipe stuff, is hotter than what's over here. This is really passive cooling, it's going to get wicked hot. And they give you one of these. This is a, a stock gasket, it's old, it was on here. Anyway, I polished it up a little bit. It's made out of stainless steel and it has a fiber gasket sandwich in there. It's kind of a harsh environment and if it didn't wrap it, it would tear up. So, anyway, that fiber gasket acts as an insulator. So you put that on there and the flange is now insulated to some extent from that. So why not just put two of them on? And now we've got even more insulation. And let's think about these studs. Okay, so I insulated the flange by putting in some nice gaskets. What do I do with these studs? Well, the studs are, of course, also attached to the flange. So the studs, which are embedded deeply into the head, are going to transfer heat from out here into the head. What can we do with these studs? Take these studs out and replace them with a stainless steel stud. So let's take a look at the property of stainless steel that enables it to become a, an assistant in your goal to uh, prevent the head from getting hot. So I've got a metal company here that uh, sells products of various types, but they've got a nice little table of heat transfer constants, what they call a K value. Standard carbon steel, such as those studs that are in there, they come with your heads. K value of 50. Stainless steel is a lower K value of 15. So right there. If you replace those studs with this, the heat transfer through the stud is one third a little bit more than one third less. It helps to isolate the manifold from the head through nothing more than just a material property change. Okay, a few more details. This is what is called a squish combustion chamber. Uh, your Volkswagen combustion chamber basically takes it, the air comes in and more or less slams into the back of the intake valve, which is you know, not a particularly good idea. But they try and augment it with what is called the squish. So this flat area down in here, the piston comes up and as it gets pretty darn close, I mean really close, it's not going to squish until the piston gets pretty darn close. We're talking like about 30 degrees before top dead center, right around the time that you would spark the ignition, you begin to get squish. It then squishes up until just shortly before you get to top dead center because you're of course building pressure inside the combustion chamber. At some point that's going to beat against the pressures that are trying to force the squish out. What it does is it produces an ooze that comes out across this thing. So you catch the flame here, which is kind of swirling around, but the flame catches the squish, which is coming out like this. So the flame catches the squish, runs along this edge. It helps to spread the flame quicker to the back ends of the combustion chamber. These are the far ends. You know, you don't coming across, you have to go across here, across there, across there. So it helps to build it to the wide spots of the chamber. And the same thing is happening over here as well. If you happen to throw the spark and it catches this, you'll get a little squish across here. Another thing they refer to this as the quench area. And, uh, and true to its name, quench means you don't put out some fire, uh, which means there's no burning. Once you've got the piston up into the point where it gets under this, you don't burn what sits in here. So you need what's in here to be as small as possible 
and you need this quench area to be what it is. What that means then is you don't come in here and mess with this edge. All right, maybe you take a little tiny piece of sandpaper and you go just like this and that's it. You don't cut it back because it screws with the squish. This is uh, There's no flame in this area, so this part of the combustion chamber, down in here and up in there, these areas are cold. So you don't have to worry about a sharp edge in this area. Uh, additionally, when you put uh, spacers into your motor because, well, you know, my combustion chamber is too small, I've got to make my combustion chamber the right size for my compression ratio, you end up putting spacers in. 060 is about as big as you ever want to go with that spacer. So, if you need to get combustion chamber volume, putting it in this area is a bad idea. It's going to reduce the amount of squish that you get. Another side effect of squish is that it is a knock reducer. So you've then put the space into a place where it doesn't burn, so you've increased the amount of fuel that's sitting in a place that doesn't burn, uh, and you've reduced your knock capabilities. So that means that you probably are going to have to run a lower compression, lower efficiency, more power to produce the same amount of power, more fuel to produce the same amount of power. All, all of it's bad. So what I'm going to tell you is that you should run not the 060 from the factory, but 040. You should tighten it down even more. And in my own motor, I run about 030 deck height, about three quarters of a millimeter. All right, let me see if I can summarize here real quick. All right, let me start with the carbs. All right, center mount is like the worst you can do. And you do splits like this. Singles or duals doesn't really matter so long as you got the split and then if you want to go even better than that you go fuel injection so fuel injection really good at monitoring the system keeping your fuel ratios air fuel ratios where they belong in order to keep down the heat next thing you want to do is a design consideration a compression ratio you always run as much compression as you can get. High compression results in high efficiency. High efficiency means that you've sucked more of the energy out to push yourself down the road. That means less energy is available to make your heads hot. What that compression ratio is, that's up to you to decide. You just run as much as you can. Uh, the final thing I think that I touched on in this is another design consideration. Deck height. You don't run deck height more than what came with the thing stock. 060. Push it above that, you lose squish. If you lose squish, you lose efficiency. The fuel doesn't burn right. It burns lazy. It burns late. You don't hit peak pressures. You get hot exhaust. Your motor runs hot. So I think that's about right. And, uh, you know, as far as my stuff goes, as I mentioned, I run a low deck, 030. I got split carbs. And I run about 8.2 to 1 compression. And... As you know, I run about 87 octane, and it runs just fine on the 87. All right, I'm not sure what I'm going to do on the next one, but uh, certainly at least two more of these. More later.